hosting this call. From the traditional and ancestral land of the Massachusetts and Wampanoag peoples. Yes. Hello, my name is Ariana. I'm so honored to be here um, with you for our first event hosted by a brand new student group here at Harvard. We are GOAT, uh, which stands for Colectivo Olin, Ancestral Traditions and Languages. And we're a group of students um, across campus who are dedicated to decolonization, indigenous knowledge and languages, ancestral healing, and solidarity across Avia Yala, also known as the Americas. Um, we also want to take uh, this opportunity to thank our list of sponsors and partners who have made this event possible. So please bear with me, the list is long. Um, we have the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies, the Ed Secondary, Harvard Native American Program, and Natives at Harvard College. We have Harvard Forza Latina, Moses uh, Mesoamerican Archive and Research Project, the Harvard Undergraduate Association, and the Harvard Divinity School. And my name is Rebecca Mendoza Nunziato. Um, I can bring myself into the spotlight here. <laughs> and um, I have the honor and joy of helping to manage the Zoom call and supporting the amazing students of Coat. I wanna acknowledge that this event comes out of our desire as students to humbly and intentionally engage with complicated topics and complex and painful realities as a result of colonization. And here at Harvard, we want to do the work that's been set before us, largely by our elders, um, by our community members, and we're here listening for marching orders. How can we use our education and resources at the service of liberation and decolonization? And so for that reason, we've organized a two-part event. Tonight, we're here together to listen to some amazing leaders, organizers, educators. And then on Friday, we will be in a community dialogue here on campus with whoever is willing to join us for that here on the Harvard campus. Um, so it's an honor to be here with all of you. And I just really wanna celebrate that uh, this is a beautiful first gathering and I appreciate you all logging on tonight. Thank you. Um, to provide a pretty quick overview of how tonight will run, we will begin by introducing our guest speakers who will each share more about their work with us. And we will then leave some time for our panelists to respond to one another um, before opening the floor for questions from the general audience. So if you have any questions you'd like to ask, please enter them into the chat. Um, and if you are attending in person, one of our moderators will assist you with that. Um, and one of us will then spotlight you if you're comfortable so that you may ask your questions directly. Again, our goal here is to create a safe space for conversation. So please don't hesitate to ask questions or make any comments you would like. Um, yeah. And I want to introduce these two wonderful students who have who have taken on the uh, the role of moderators for this event. Um, two of many who have made this happen. So first we have Dariana Gonzalez, who's a sophomore here at Harvard from Guanajuato, Mexico. And she's currently studying integrative biology with a language citation in Portuguese at Harvard College. She's one of Coat's co-presidents. And our joke is that we have many. We're trying to have a horizontal leadership structure. Um, and a fun fact of Dariana's is that she's been learning Nahuatl from Quiz Speak Nahuatl courses. And that's what sparked her interest in decolonial spaces in education. And then we have Anthony Miguel, who's a second year student from California with origins from Santa Maria Tataltepec, Tatal a Pueblo in the Mixtec region of Oaxaca. Anthony is majoring in computer science, minoring in ethnicity, migration, and rights, and aiming for a language citation in Japanese. And as a fun fact, he's also involved in Natives at Harvard College and the Quechua Initiative on Global Indigeneity. Okay, I'll pass it over to Anthony to introduce our first speaker. Okay, so we're going to start off with Odilia Romero, who is the co-founder and executive director of Comunidades Indígenas en Liderazgo, also known as Cielo. She is also an independent interpreter of Zapotec, Spanish, and English for indigenous communities in Los Angeles and throughout California. Organizing indigenous migrant communities has been a part of her work for over a decade. Among her numerous academic publications, awards, and lectures, she has been a guest lecturer at Johns Hopkins University, USC, Stanford, and UCLA. Ms. Romero has published on the challenges of organizing indigenous communities, developing women's leadership, and pre preserving the culture of indigenous communities. She has also been featured in the Los Angeles Times, the New York Times, Vogue, Time, and Democracy Now. I'm sorry, I, I was uh, sneezing here. 
Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for being here and thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I have, um, uh, let me see if I could do this. Um, okay. Give me one minute. Um, Are you able to see my screen? Uh, we're seeing a Zoom icon that says screen broadcast. Oh no, okay. Oh, let me see. Uh, how do I share my screen with you all? Um, it might be which screen oh. you're sharing. You can also share it with us and we can um, put it up for you, whatever is easiest for you. Okay, no, this is getting too complicated. <laughs> okay, well, I don't have to, to share a screen, uh, but, uh, um, you know, based on, on your, on, on, on the invite, I prepared um, a presentation is like, who names us and why, right? Um, and for us, you know, as indigenous people, who names us and why is very important because it leads to land rights, it leads to linguistic violence of indigenous peoples um, back home and here. Um, and the question for me is always, why did the state and the, the academics have to name us, right? Uh, because we don't name ourselves. Like, for example, um, I know myself as Bender Fujo, but once I come to, out of Fujo, you know, I become Zapotec, I become Oaxacan, I become Latina here, I become Mexican, something I did not know that even existed as a child. So when we ask the question, like, why do they name us? Um, and for me, in my personal opinion, is for divide and also for violence, right? The, um, why do they want to label us? I'll, I'll tell you um, a thing about labeling. Um, the Mexican government has these labels of different languages. Um, for example, um, it has... Totsil de los altos, Totsil del centro, Totsil este alto, este bajo, noroeste, norte alto. That doesn't mean anything to somebody that speaks Totsil, right? That, um, or in my case, Zapoteco este, Zapoteco bajo, Zapoteco noroeste. That doesn't mean anything to my mom. If I were to be detained and I speak in the two dominant languages, and they ask me if I speak Zapoteco Alto Bajo, most likely I will say yes. Uh, and then what happens when they bring a, a, an interpreter that probably thinks he speaks Zapoteco Alto Noroeste, we won't match. And with this, you know, um, it could be a life and death. So these labelings are very dangerous. They have been dangerous, they continue to be dangerous and they continue to um, um, violence against indigenous people back home and in the migration process and here in the US. Um, this labeling, um, uh, I'm so sorry, but my throat hurts. So, <laughs> so, I've, uh, so the interest of um, labeling us is actually to, create, uh, to continue these human rights violations to dehumanize us uh, as people, as indigenous people. But because this conversation is happening at Harvard, you know, um, I'm asking you all like, why do we support this? There's a whole generation of people, of indigenous people, of Latine community going to Harvard, going to these different uh, universities. Like how would you help our struggle as people that are on the ground? 
Uh, for example, in a meeting with some people, they show me a card that says Zapoteco de la Planicia Costera. If you were to detain a person from Zapote uh, the live in the Zapoteco de la Planicia Costera, they probably don't, don't know that because it's Zapoteco de Juchitán. You know, Zapoteco de Tehuantepec, but it's not Zapoteco de la Planicia Costera. And this happens a lot. We work a lot with detained children. And when they come up with the cards and they say, hey kid, what, do you, what, what language do you speak? Do you speak, um, you know, Tuxil Alto Este? The kid most likely will say no. Or if it's a Guatemalan language, they will also know. But this labeling is very dangerous. It leads to human rights violation. It leads to um, not only at the border, but also at the schools. It's also at the hospital. You know, labeling is, it leads to our human rights violations. So you as young people, my question to you is like, how do you create? I mean, I understand that you're in this system and I, I always, um, you're in this system where there's a lot of knowledge, but also that knowledge is, has been created and produced for non-people of color. So how do we come back to that community and don't look at us with the colonizer's eyes and with the colonizer's idea? How do you support our struggle as indigenous organizations, a black organization? Because, you know, um, uh, the other thing we get a lot is like um, this, um, I, I rarely say yes to conversations to academia because I feel that it's very extractive, right? I constantly get emails saying, hey, my thesis is doing two months. Can you answer these questions? Oh, hey, Senorita Romero, like, I need you to answer these. Well, Senorita, like I'm 52, uh, do your research before you send me an email, right? But how you do not, how do you work with us and not come that put the pressure? Like, I'm sorry that I'm, you know, uh, that there's a deadline on your thesis, but how is that my fault, right? How is that my problem? You never asked me if you were gonna do a research in Cielo and you never asked how it's gonna benefit Cielo's work. You know, for example, right now here, I am having this conversation with you all, but the Cielo team is helping in the repatriation of, uh, of the fire that happened in Juarez because one of our team members, cousin, die in the fire. You know, the other Cielo team, there are connecting calls nationwide uh, at a detained child, because even though we don't, it's not hurting the news anymore, you know, there's still kids detained, there's still people at the border, uh, there's still people held up somewhere. You know, there's an incident going on at a hospital, at a police station, uh, and people that don't support, people, indigenous people that don't speak Spanish and English. So all this has an impact when labels are involved, right? And a lot of the things like, and if you have any question, I guess you could stop me. Um, and the other issue that we have with the labeling and narratives is the Latinidad, right? Um, Latinidad movement and um, is very important. And we are in full support of the liberation of the Latino brothers and, and relatives but also it erases our existence. You know, it erases our culture, our language, when, and actually wearing our clothes doesn't mean you're in solidarity, actually. You make it more expensive and unaffordable for us as indigenous people. So the, the struggle of Latinidad is important, but that's another label that erases and contributes to the language violence of indigenous people here in the US, if we're only talking about the US. So, I, we, um, so going, going back to your question, like, well, who labels us and why? I think that's a question for you all to answer. But what I tell you, the labeling hurts us from, from this other side of academia. It hurts the family at the LAPD station. It hurts the family uh, at a detention center. It hurts the family, it hurts the family at a hospital at LAUSD in our school district here or in Escondido or in Oregon or in, in Seattle, it, helps, it hurts someone. 
and we need to change that. We need to change this labeling. And this conversation, of course, happens without us, right? Uh, when these labels happen, when these labels are happening, when this deconstruction of knowledge is happening, we're not there. There's a few of us that are uh, now in academia, but the community itself is not there, you know? Um, I'll tell you something funny. My mom, I'm like, oh, I'm so sad because this happened. Or, or, or I'll tell her, like, she would see me on TV, all because this is what happened to indigenous people. And she's like, ¿Tú cuando has sufrido? Yo te mandaba dólares. ¿De qué hablas? You know, people resist. And sometimes we accept these uh, labels as a way of resistance. Like my mom, she is Zapoteca, she speaks the language. My mom doesn't know how to read and write. Well, she's learning now through YouTube. Um, but my mom is very savvy. If she needs to label herself as Latina in a form or outside the Zapotec community, she will. But at home and with our community, she's a woman from Sobocho. You know, there's also these like these resistance from the community. There's a lot of, uh, we're, you know, I always say like, if we're here 530 years after, like we're super smart and super savvy because you figure things out in order to resist. The fact that languages are spoken here in LA or that we have over 42 brass bands from Oaxaca and we still have the Chirimia, it's a symbol of resistance and resilience from the community that we shouldn't have, but it's there, you know? So I, I think um, as much as these labels are forced on us with such violence in paperwork, there's a lot of resistance. Sure, sure, I'll, I'll be whatever makes you happy. I tell that to people all the time. I'll be Mexicana, I'll be whatever makes you happy because as far as I know, I'm from Soachense. And that is my contribution to this conversation. So if you have any uh, questions, please feel free to ask me. Thank you so much. You. Um, oh, sorry, go ahead, Anthony. No, I was going, I was just going to say thank you for your um your words. Um we're saving questions for the end. So Diana is going to introduce the next panelist. Yes, thank you again. That was, I think that was a very powerful introduction to, to this conversation. We hope that that uh, we have a lot of questions about this um, presentation. Um, but without further ado, I have the honor of introducing our second um, panelist for tonight, um, Cuitlavac Arrola Martinez. Cuitlava Carriola Martinez is a Nahuatl learner, teacher, and language activist. They teach learners of all ages and from diverse backgrounds. Cuitlava has been teaching virtually since 2018 on Zoom, and they've uh, taught at various campuses across Southern California and recently presented a webinar at Central Washington University. The quiz work is primarily centered around the Nahuatl language. Their work in uh, language instruction and activism empowers all communities to speak their indigenous languages. Thank you, Kui, for joining us tonight and for sharing this space with us. Um, and when you're ready, I'll turn it over to you. Um, so I will be giving a presentation, right? Um, language work in relation to indigeneity, Latinidad, and identity in Abya Yala. Um, did you know that there are 7,000 languages spoken around the world, an approximate, and about 10% of those languages are spoken in Abya Yala. Um, so if you didn't know that, now you know. Um, and so I will be speaking about who I am, uh, where I come from, um, my language work, um, how does indigeneity and Latinidad manifest in the classroom, um, and what does indigeneity mean to me, right? Um, we can start by talking about some of the definitions of the words. Um, so language work, right? Language work involves learning a language, right? Acquiring the language and teaching as well, imparting that knowledge, right? The, the language uh, to people, um, learning new, methods as you go by, um, learning how people learn, right? And making sure that, you know, the classroom 
um, fits a lot of the people there, right? Um, and indigeneity, right? Indigeneity, indigenous is also, it's a broad term. Um, here's one definition, right? Origin, originating or occurring naturally in a particular place. Um, and then of a people um, who have lived in the land since earlier times, right? And prior to the arrival of colonizers. Um, and Latinidad, again, another broad term, um, but this is one definition, right? Shared cultural, social, and historical experiences with uh, Latin American heritage and ancestry, right? Um, however, this blends all the diversity of cultures, languages, identities, people, and Abiyala, right? Um, and it's constructed through the erasure of indigenous languages and people and cultures, right? Which are seen as obstacles to modernity, right? And development, right? Um, and identity is a sense of who we are as individuals, right? Um, and in social groups. Um, some examples are gender, race, ethnicity, tribal affiliation, sexual orientation, cultural background, immigration status as well, right? Those are all some examples. Um, so what does indigeneity mean to me, right? It means where I'm from, right? This is when I was born. I was born in the traditional land to the Cocopa and Kumeyaay people, uh, or so-called Mexicali, Baja California. Um, on my mother's side, I'm uh, from Hayamitla, Jalisco. Uh, my grandparents are from there. Uh, the traditional lands of the Cascan or Cascan people. And on my father's side, I'm from El Quelite, uh, the traditional lands of the Totorames. Um, so this is my identity, right? And within these colonial borders of the Mexican state, um, well, I'm Mexican, right? I am Mexican, I'm a Mexican national, I'm Mexicano, Mexicane. Um, and living there and being with my grandma and with my grandma, also going back to her hometown in Hayamitla, um, you know, running around in the rain, singing with other kids, playing around with kids, eating the traditional uh, foods that are there, um, guamuchiles, um, tamales, right, pozole, which is still, you know, part of our food ways, uh, tamales, um, is also part of, of my identity, right? It's, it's also part of me. Um, and, you know, bringing back traditions as well, right, um, Planting corn is, is part of my, um, my family. Um, it's only a gen generation ago that we stopped um, planting, cultivating, and harvesting corn. And I just planted some corn uh, earlier this week or last week, I believe. So, you know, these traditions can be brought back, right? Um, so, right, Mexican national here, right? Um, and so migrations, right? In Abriella, there's been migrations throughout time, right? Since time immemorial, whether it be displacement, forced migration uh, for better economic opportunities. Um, and so I migrated to the traditional lands of the Shumash, right? And so-called Oxnard. Um, then after that, to Pasadena and Rosemead, under the traditional lands of the Tongva and Quiche uh, people. So, right, labels. So who am I here now? What am I now? Now I'm Hispanic, right? I'm a person that speaks Spanish. I'm a Spanish speaker from Latin America now, right? Now I have to learn English. Now I have to learn English. There is no other way, right? I remember as a kid, being put in the corner of a room because the Spanish speakers are there, right? So as being assimilated into another language, right? Um, and noting that, you know, when I was, you know, in the Cascan traditional lands, Cascan was a language also now it was spoken, right? Cascan and now are no longer spoken in Hayamitla, 
but the, some of the flora and the fauna still have their own traditional names. I've learned of a specific type of fig tree called Iguera in Spanish, and it either has a Kashkan or Nahuatl name, and it's Kamishin. And I say Kashkan or Nahuatl because um, uh, Kashkan and Nahuatl were, were spoken there, right, historically. Um, right, and then now I'm Latino um, because I speak Spanish, right, because I'm from Latin America. Um, and so part of this work of language where there's activism involved, it actually is one of the things that drove me to language work. Um, I still do this. Um, so now I'm still in my migration process. Now I'm in so-called Eugene, Oregon, uh, traditional lands of the Kalapuya people. Um, if you see this sign here, this is Kalapuyan land. This is actually an, um, a mobile art exhibition that goes around Oregon that teaches about the Kalapuya people. Um, there are signs at the school at the University of Oregon. Um, and somebody, some people, I don't know who it was, but they wrote not. This is not Kalapuyan land, right? So taking up space, being in the protests with students, with the youth, right? Supporting that um, is also part of my work. Um, and when I migrated to the US, I, I'm an immigrant, right? I'm an immigrant. Um, so advocating for myself, advocating for immigration rights um, against ICE as well, protests, right? Um, the No Dapo movement, no, no Dakota Access Pipeline, right? The wrecking of the land is the ongoing, is part of the ongoing process of colonization. Colonization has not stopped. It's an ongoing process, right? Um, and so I follow pound language work. Um, and this is all community-based. Um, my teacher, Yang Garcia, um, started this collective, Tlatlo Tapasoli, which means language nest, which centers not just Nahuatl, but other languages as well. Um, so having spaces where um, Nahuatl as well other languages are centered um, is resisting in itself. Um, English, Spanish, French, even Dutch are the dominant languages in Nabia Yala. Why? Well, because of colonization. Um, so it's us teaching about ourselves, right? Uh, we have people from different ages coming to our classes. Um, and through the pandemic, um, you know, still doing that work every Sunday, right? Every Sunday, uh, doing workshops at uh, colleges, San Bernardino Valley Colleges, UC Riverside, um, and continuing that work even at uh, cultural centers, at autonomous spaces, uh, specifically for queer and trans and people of color, uh, like Flora y Tierra, right? So hosting those language workshops, right? Um, and these conversations of identities happen in these spaces as well, and not just learning the language, right? These, these come up as well. Um, so that identity, you know, so th those things come up. Continuing the language work, right, with the youth, with the children. And it's all community based, right? Um, when I was teaching, I listed some of the schools I, I've taught workshops at, especially with Semita's preschool, the parents were also involved, right? So learning a language um, also involves everyone, right? Part of the community. And through the pandemic, well, in virtual spaces, right? Um, this specific photo right here uh, to the right um, is from El Dia del Niño, La Plaza de Cultura y Artes. Um, I remember, of course, you know, we had games, we had, um, you know, how games and coloring books about colors and um, a loteria game. So the kids were interested in that. Um, 
what we also did is we wrote a list of some Nahuatl words that come from, sorry, some Spanish words that come from Nahuatl. Jitomate, tomate, aguacate, uh, coyote. So the adults were actually interested in that list, right? So, you know, and then realizing, oh yeah, that's right. It doesn't come from Spanish. It's not an English word as well, right? So learning about that, right? It, it helps people to realize those things, right? And maybe they went to learn something else, right? Um, maybe they went to go and organize a group, right? At, at the campus, right? And we have Daliana that did this, right? So, um, right? So on Zoom at, at different spaces, right? So Pasadena City College, Kelsey Fullerton, and of people of all ages, Right, people of all ages. Um, right, so that's a little bit about my work. Um, if you want to learn more about us and the work that we do, the, our events, um, we host uh, some free classes at times. The classes at La Plaza are still free there. So if you are in LA, you can go. And that's all. Plaza Mati, thank you. Thank you so much for, for sharing more about your work with us. Um, Anthony, would you like to introduce our next speaker? Yes, um, thank you once again. Um, so now I'll be introducing Dr. Marcelo Gar Garzo Montal Montalvo, um, who is a musician, dancer, and assistant professor of ethnic studies at California State University, San Marcos. They are a first-generation Chilean, Canadian, American of Mapuche and Spanish descent. They hold a BA, MA, and PhD in Comparative Ethnic Studies from UC Berkeley, and were a community college transfer student from Miracosta, Cabrillo, and San Diego City Colleges. Their teaching and research focus on comparative and critical approaches to Black, Indigenous, Latinx, and Chicanx studies, as well as dance and performance studies. Uh, hola, saludos, uh, Mari Mari. Let's see if I can uh, share my screen también. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Oh my God, I have, hold on. I have like technical difficulties. I need to like give Zoom permission to. Take your time, no worries. Things. I'm on my university computer and everything has to like, uh, let's see here. A ver si esto funciona. Hey, it works. I gave permission, ask for, asking you shall receive. Okay, saludos. Eh, my, my, eh, Piali, no chime, to my Nahuatl hablante relatives, greetings. Um, I thank you for the invitation. Um, really honored to be in conversation with these folks. So thank you, Odilia and Cui, for your work and for sharing it. And um, I'm honored to uh, share a little bit from my perspectives and my work um, and do a little bit similar of like just kind of situate myself and um, I want us to hang out with this image. I didn't make it. I wish I did. You know, it's a beautiful mural that exists that was made at the Centro Pluricultural Emiliano Zapata in Ciudad Nezahualcoyot in Estado de Mexico in 2013 um, in solidarity between folks from the South and the North. So I just kind of want to bring that energy in that I feel is at the heart of why a lot of us um, breathe life into this uh, Kuna concept of Abya Yala, um, which brings us together and reminds us how we're related. So I hope that my palabra and my sharing my thoughts helps with that effort. And um, I hope to uh, do this uh, in a good way with respect and um, uh, I'm here in the traditional lands of the Payum Kawichum. So I just want to give thanks also to my Payum Kawichum and Kumiai and Ipai and Kupangashwichem relatives here. Uh, I'm in so called San Marcos, California, in Southern California and uh, North County, San Diego. Um, and uh, I guess the, the work is asking us, or the, the questions are asking us to think and share from like our work and our community. So I just want to kind of like, 
share in general terms what that means for me. And then I'll share a little bit about how um, some general reflections on indigeneity and Latinidad, as you all have asked us to do, which I really appreciate um, learning from the other speakers and this conversation. And uh, I'm gonna, hopefully if time permits, I can share a specific uh, example from uh, actually like what I would consider my research, which of course is always like embedded in my own uh, reconnecting and healing process. So um, my, if you're asking me what my work is. Um, I'm an artist, I'm a danzante. Um, I'm an ethnic studies uh, scholar and educator and researcher. Uh, I'm a cultural practitioner um, in the sense that I'm committed to protecting our traditional music and dance traditions and traditional medicine and ways that we hang out with plants. And especially I'm committed to um, continuing the ways uh, of ceremony of my ancestors. Um, who are my communities uh, that I'm speaking of and thinking of? Um, it's as complex as my other relatives have shared uh, and um, is uh, really shaped by the, the structures and the histories that um, we're all uh, thinking about or that you all have been sharing about. So. Uh, I'm the child of folks who were um, exiled from Chile, uh, the current settler nation state known as Chile in South America uh, during the dictatorship in the 1970s after a US CIA backed coup. Um, and my parents left to Mexico, which is one of our connections to Mexico of our many. And they lived in Mexico Tenochtitlan, AKA Mexico City. And um, there, uh, eventually actually ended up working at a, a place, uh, a resort in a place called Cocoyoc. And between those places um, actually met a Canadian family, um, Canadian settler family who uh, invited my parents to be sponsored through MSD International as refugees to go to Canada. So I was born in Toronto in Canada. As a result, my brother was born in Winnipeg. Um, and it, as a child, I was, uh, we, we moved here to San Diego County, um, Kumiai land, and, and I grew up here, went to like public school K through 12 in this area. And I also, um, my migration took me to Ohlone land, also known as the Bay Area, East Bay, uh, Berkeley, Oakland, Richmond, El Cerrito, and lived there for about 15 years uh, on Ohlone land in Chechenyo, Lishan, Ohlone land. Um, so it's a little bit about like, just kind of like my migration, but if you ask me who are my communities, so that includes uh, Chilenos, that includes uh, displaced peoples, uh, Latinx peoples. Um, my indigenous roots are Mapuche, and uh, those are roots that I'm continuing to search for and reconnect with. I was not raised with a strong Mapuche identity, um, but that is, I was raised more as a Latino, a US Latino person, but definitely um, have been um, blessed and honored to reconnect on my paternal side with my roots in Quilquén, Chaigén, Temuco, and Angol, um, specific parts of Walmapu in the South, which is here. This is Walmapu. This is a beautiful representation. These are some of my ancestors who are the, the uh, Rucas, who are the um, the, uh, the mountains there, otherwise known as the Andes, um, and the, uh, the Southern Andes, and this is the Pehuen tree. It's uh, misnamed the Araucaria uh, in the Western system. And um, I would also just like, because of I think my migration, uh, it's important to name that I'm also very much in relation to, I would call like a Chicana Indigena community and project and world and worldview. And so I'm thinking from that experience with a lot of Chicanx relatives who are um, thinking, uh, of course, this emerges from like Mexican and Mexican American um, liberation movements and indigeneities. But uh, actually, some of my research looks at all the ways that a lot of non Mexicans have always been a part of Chicana and Chicano indigeneity um, and movements. And um, it, I'm very much have been in, re in relation with that project of the way that Chicanx folks are, are 
aiming to uh, reconnect and honor our roots and especially as folks in, who are positioned as de-indigenized or de-tribalized, de-nationalized, de right? People who have been removed from our indigenous nationhood and language um, through genocide and settler colonialism as my relatives have shared already. Um, but through that um, it is also how I've, uh, I become a danzante. I am very passionate and I love danza azteca. That's one of my practices that I'm thinking from today with you all. And um, it, it's a very beautiful tradition and I feel um, honored to be, have been called on to be able to be a lanzante in ceremony. And so um, that's kind of one of the anchors of what I'm gonna share. It, the last couple of things I'll just say before I move on to some reflections is I'm also a punk rocker. So if you ask me who are my communities, I'm a punk, I'm a metalhead. Um, I'm an experimental musician. Um, I identify as queer and non-binary. Um, and with my communities, especially Chicana and Indigena communities, we're kind of like negotiating and, and, and working a lot with our relation to this idea of being two spirit, um, which of course has a different context and lineage, but um, part of a very a lot of groups that call themselves Chicana and Indigena two spirits. Um, and so just thinking about how do we reconnect with our indigeneity, but also how does that maybe change the way that we're related to um, the ways we've been colonized through these things called like gender and sexuality and the way that we relate to each other and our energies. Um, so that's uh, just a little bit about like, that's the various kind of intersections that I'm thinking about um, or that who I am to, uh, and some of my practices, I guess. And, um, Within that, so these are the kind of the reflections I wanted to share about um, what does Latinidad mean to me? What does indigeneity mean to me? But also how does that like informed by my conversation with my communities and my practices? And if, I guess the first thing I kind of want to share is that I, I tend to think of Latinidad and indigeneity like in the plural. And I think that's important for me. So not just Latinidad, but Latinidades and uh, not just indigeneity, but indigeneities. And I think that's important because I think what's generally kind of like uh, imposed upon us is I would call it like a dominant or a colonial Latinidad, uh, which of course is white supremacist in the form of mestizaje, right? Like calling us saying, oh, we're all mestizos is actually a white supremacist project. Um, it's a settler colonial project. Um, it's an anti-black project. It's a heteropatriarchal formation of who we are. Um, as folks have shared before, it's about emphasizing our identity through the nation state, which is like stolen indigenous land. And um, so that's just to like name that, like that's what usually what we're thinking about with Latinidad and why I put my strike through is like when it's thought of in that way, that's like dominant Latinidad. That like, and for me also like, seeks to erase, I would even imagine um, other uh, Latinidades, right? And of course, seeks to erase in particular our, our indigeneities, right? Um, it's a genocidal project, right? In, in these senses. Um, so, um, but beyond that, I think, um, uh, therefore I'd like to also though, like a lot of my research is trying to like, in ethnic studies, we do a lot of like addressing the silences or trying to unearth, right? Those things that have been kind of erased um, through the way that dominant education and research is done, much like actually what Odilia was mentioning of the way that, right? The, the academy has been and, and the university and education has been so extractive in erasing, trying to really uh, extract uh, knowledge for the sake of kind of Western education. Um, I think ethnic studies is trying to change that, right? That's one of the small uh, projects that one of the, one of our interventions in that way. And what I've been trying to research is what are these things that we could think of as like the, or what are these Latinidades that we could think of as like the underside of a dominant Latinidad, right? These like other Latinidades with a capital O, meaning those of us who are the other within Latinidad. So the silenced or what maybe Franz Fanon would call le damne, like what's mistranslated as the wretched of the earth. But what that means then is like, 
what it like I take seriously, for example, like Lorgia Garcia Pena really theorizes like black Latinidad, right? That's another Latinidad. Um, what are there is the possibility of having indigenous Latinidades. And I'm also even thinking of Asian American, Arab, Muslim, queer, non-binary, right? What are all these other Latinidades that we could think of that um, are have sought to be erased in the dominant project of Latinidad? And within that, also then I'm thinking about like what Latinidad means to me in so many ways, it me it's precisely like de-indigenizing. Uh, it's precisely like displacement, right? What people are talking about. And I think if indigeneity is about being place-based, as I agree with my relatives who shared that, it's about being from a place and knowing the language of that place, the medicine of that place, our relationship to the stars from that place, different things that I've learned in reconnecting with indigenous knowledge and my ancestors and my family. Um, what does it mean then to like, it's, I feel like we, and I, I work um, with my students a lot, actually, I didn't name that, but that's like a big part of my practice that I'm thinking with. I teach classes about this and I work with a lot of students who are working through this together and I learn with them. And a lot of times we come to this space of like, Okay, a lot of us, of course, I can't speak for any, all of us who are in Latinidad, but a lot of us end up feeling as if we're like displaced, place-based people, right? So like, we're kind of in a really um, complex uh, position of what some people call like diaspora, you know, like, how does it, how do we maintain the fact that we are like people of the land, people of planet earth? You know, like the word Mapuche means people of the earth. Mapu is land, Che is pueblo. That's a lot of, um, that says a lot, right? That's what it means. But how do we, how are we Mapuche if we are really far from our Mapu traditionally, but of course still on the same Mapu in a larger sense. But uh, so that's just a little bit of kind of where I'm, I'm thinking about like the possibility of actually like really subversive Latinidades, like really of how a Latinidad actually might give us a really long, beautiful tradition of cultural resistance. Um, but if we don't really critique it and, and think about it and historicize it, then perhaps it's, it will, the Latinidad in our everyday speak is a very kind of like dominant colonial project. Um, how am I for time, uh, Rebecca or anybody? How much more time should I take? I don't wanna, I wanna respect the, the flow. Um, you have about one more minute, but take your time. One more minute. Okay, I took too long. I'll share a little bit from like what I'm calling like my research. Uh, it's a project that I'm calling Armas Milagrosas. And I'm naming that after a book of poetry by an Afro-Caribbean poet named Amese Ser, who wrote a collection called Les Armes Miracules. He's thinking about a poetry as a weapon, or as even Audre Lorde, right, Black feminist poet, um, ancestor, also said, you know, I'm a warrior and my, my, my weapon is poetry. I think about that in terms of our cultural traditions of music and dance in particular, and most of my research focuses on, on this, um, on our music and our dance traditions and our embodied knowledge that actually ask the question, like, what would Latinidad look like from these traditions, right? And the short version is that often this, what it means to be Latinx actually is by and large cultural practices that are indigenous and Afro-diasporic in particular, and that, that particular relationality, right? It's all thought of in so many problematic ways, I think is mestizaje, but I really push back on the way that that uh, actually erases more than it kind of shows the ways that we're related. So I'm happy to talk more about that in the Q and A if folks want, but just to give you an idea of where I'm at right now is really looking at um, the instruments themselves. That's like what I'm calling our armas, because that's what we, in danza, we call these our armas, meaning we're in uh, a war, we're in the conditions of war, and these are the armas that we use, right? They're not guns, but we use the wewe, the ayakashli, we're related to the teponashli, or our chachas, or even, you know, the guitar, or the concha, um, or, all these other instruments that are, are represented here in this in the south, the chuchuca, the charango, the eh, cajon, the cajon, all of these, I just uh, want to just um, offer that as 
a way that we might think of like what are our heritages of cultural resistance and survival, even if these are the result of colonizers, we still use the colon even the colonizers instruments for our own liberation and decolonization. So I'll leave it there for the sake of time. And again, thanks for the invite and the conversation. Thank you so much, Marcelo. Um, those are some, some really incredible reflections and we really appreciate them. Um, so our, our final speaker for the night is Dr. Sue Patricia Haglund. Sue is a Dule poet scholar native of Panama. She received her poet, or sorry, she received her doctorate in uh, political science from the University of Hawaii at Manoa with a specialization in indigenous politics. Her published work can be found in the first anthology of Dule poetry, Antología de Poetas Cunas, Indigenous Interfaces, Spaces, Technology, and Social Networks in Mexico and Central America, Intentions Journal, Latino Studies, North Dakota Quarterly, and Kipuka, Finding Refuge in Times of Change. Welcome, um, Dr. Haglund, and thank you for joining us tonight. Um, the floor is yours. Noe Gambi, Anuguasue Patricia Haglund. I am um, Kuna, Panamian American. Um, to to follow up after amazing, amazing uh, relatives and speakers, um, I like to talk about the summation and try to connect what um, was covered and tie it in with the understanding of Abayala and the understanding of our locations, our rate, our positionalities, and our um, relational uh, spaces that we navigate. One of the things that I want to talk about is my journey. Oftentimes, um, growing up, I grew up in Oceanside, California in the 80s. Um, I'm originally from Panama. I grew up as a Kuna Panamanian. Even though my father was American, I didn't grow up with an American identity. So I don't um, connect to the idea of um, Latin, Latinx, um, Hispanic. Um, these were experiences I've encountered in the fourth grade in Oceanside, California. And that was the first time I had to understand um, that um, I couldn't say I was Kuna and Panama and that wasn't enough. Like I had to um, also go beyond language barriers because when we're talking about identity, when we're talking about where we come from, the first thing we think about is breathing, right? What do we breathe? We breathe in the airs of linguistics of the words that we speak. We breathe in the, in the airs of the spaces that we walk. And one of the things about when we learn languages in these new spaces and my own personal upbringing was stuttering. I stuttered a lot because Spanish was the dominant language I spoke with basic Kuna words with my papa baby, my grandfather. Ricardo Warren, who's Kuna, sharing some basic words, but Spanish was the dominant, English was the secondary. And I'm often reminded of how do we find that balance and the balance of breathing techniques? And to go into what is Abayala and how does that look like? I wanted to share with you the who we are as Kunas. Let me see if I can pull it up. And hold on, it's asking me for a password. <laughs> And you see the screen now? Yes, it is. Yes. It looks like it's loaded. Okay, let me load it. Um, can you see it? Yep, thank you. Okay, thank you. So one thing I want to talk about is first, um, what you're seeing here is a mola. It's a close aspect of a mola. And when I when I think about re relationality and our breathing into spaces, I often go back to our grandmother's molas, our mother's molas, our tia's molas our aunts, our, our grandmothers and our mothers, when we think about the molas, we think about language and how that is done on textile. Molas are worn on 
the Kuna women's blouses and is often seen as a decorative art in the lens of anthropology. But what it is, is really our literary, our language. It comes and speaks in different aspects. And to understand what Abayala is, it's not about a movement. Um, and I know a lot of people come across their familiarity with Abayala through Emil Kim's um, 2018 article and how this was launching this whole um, aspect of Abayala-ness and creating this, this bridge and connecting the Americas and following Russell Means' um, idea that the Americas must die. My, when, I, when I'm a kuna and I see Abayala in an academic space in 2012, for NISA, the Native American Indigenous, Indigenous Studies Association, I was a PhD student. And I was like, why is a kuna word in an academic international conference website? And how did it get here? It took a number of years to track down and find the background story and how it came out. It came out um, out of NISA. Um, Abayala working group as a way to unite and create solidarity and collectivity of Spanish speaking indigenous scholars and allies to bridge with English speaking indigenous scholars and allies. And it's a beautiful concept and collectivism that came up, but still it bothered me as a kuna because I start thinking why if we're talking about ethics and we're talking about cultural appropriation and we're talking about um, visibility and where, where we walk, why don't we critique internal appropriations? Because if we're talking about Abayala being the Americas, we only hear the superficial understandings of it. Um, okay, it's a kuna word it comes from kunayala. It's a history of abundancy of their lands. And it also came out of a conference in Ecuador that um, in the uh, 90s and 2000s from an from a Aymara um, leader who went to Abayala in 1977, who went to Kunayala in 1977. It was influenced by Kunas about what do we call the lands outside of Kunayala? Because Yala means land. And Kuna means the people. So Kunayala is land of the people. As, as we know, the history of linguistics is very important. But to understand where we are located is to understand that in Panama, Panama is a very smart country, but it's also a country that recognizes in indigenous autonomy. We have comarcas. Comarcas are indigenous autonomous regions. There is, there is shared collective aspects of land exploitation extraction, there is um, always the battle against um, fighting capitalism in these areas. But having the accountability of when we use words that don't come from places that we're familiar with, we have to be responsible and transparent enough and also recognize who we work with and acknowledge where these words come from. And for me, as a kuna, you see that Kunayala is the strip of land here, but it's also the Atlantic Oceans. We have over um, 365, if I remember, are small archipelago islands and about 50 plus of them are inhabited and others are used for cultivations of um, coconut trees because coconut becomes a staple trading um, for those um, merchants coming out of Colombia. There's also comarcas of other indigenous tribes of Panama, like Embera, Wunaan, and Kunayal has four independent nations, and the nations are Kunayala and the comarca Madugandi and Wargandi, and our ancestral lands of Darganguyala. When we talk about understanding of these places, I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen for a moment. Bear with me. And do you want me to stop your screen share? Yeah, thank you. 
I'm go. trying to find it. Sorry, I didn't want to take up too much time on trying to figure oh, it out. Right. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, going back to the, the responsibilities and understanding the stories, when we think about Abayala, we have to break down the linguistic words. Abayala is ablis, it means blood. Right, and Yala has various forms. It means mountains, territories, land, and when we when we connect it, oftentimes it gets defined as um, land of full maturity and um, land of sacred of sacred blood. But what we think about is that we have to understand that Abia Yala is not is not the idea of sangre, of blood, of humanity, but is the blood of the earth. When we are born, we are born out of the wombs of our mothers. We we are in water. We are in blood. We are in a liquidified state. And when we think of Abiyala, we cannot see it as this geographical regionalism of, of a collective hemispheric bridge. What we have to think about it is all its forms. It's relational. It's it's malleable, it changes. Abiyah Yala does not just refer to the Americas. And literally, it also means um, uh, tierras afueras, um, other lands, and outside lands, outside of Kunayala, perspectively. And that could be the continent of um, Europe, of Africa, of um, Asia, Australia, Oceania. Abiyah Yala refers to lands and waters it refers to the vitality of of our our animal relations and our human relations and when you look at this logo behind me this came out of the inspiration of dialogue by Cuenpoca and Marcelo and um, graphic artist Jazz. And we, we spent months talking about what we, how we see Abayala, not only from a Kona perspective, but a collective perspective. Um, when, from our own experiences of where we come from and how we see, and this is why you will see turtles and mountains and lands and the feathers of the bird. When we see in our understanding Abayala, it also comes from the, our narratives of Babi Gala. Babi Gala is a Kuna um, is a, a network of Kuna narratives. Um, Baba and Nana are supreme beings, and I want to read to you an excerpt um, of part of the work that I'm working on. My my project is looking on accountability and ethics, and looking at the transparencies as us as indigenous people, us as how we identify maybe as Latinx or other identities of where we come from. But why is it not okay to use the words of our own indigenous nations? Why do we have to succumb to this idea of let's regionalize, let's, let's use the words Turtle Island, let's use the words Oceania, let's use the words Abiyayala. It's such a it, I understand the motive of having wanting to connect, but it also creates such a disconnect and it still keeps people very separate and creating this disconnection. And when we are in this diasporic spaces, we are always constantly trying to renegotiate our groundings. And when we renegotiate our groundings, we are oftentimes are renegotiating ourselves. And when we renegotiate ourselves, we find a lost, but you're not lost. You're grounded by the roots of the stories, even when you are recollecting these stories. I do not like when people say, I am, I'm, I'm trying to find a connection. No, you are reconnecting. You are already connected. So you're doing a reconnection. You're not finding yourself. You're already refinding. You're reliving. You're, it, it, it's the essence of our movements of this. Um, before I digress, I want to give you an understanding of when we think of Abayala, I don't want you to think of it as what it is, is a livelihood, right? It, it's a vitality, it's a living being, like we all are. And my larger project that I'm working on is the Dulis Studies, it's on Abayala, it's counter, it's, it is in counter counter conversations of academic spaces of how Abayala has been imposed and um, in the last <laughs> seven years, Abayala has been most frequently in spaces like today. And oftentimes people don't know where, why they're using it. They saw, two, they read the 2018 article, great, 
great. But what does it mean? Does it really mean the Americas? No, it means more. When we talk about our creators, Baba and Nana are our creators. They are the supreme beings. From Baba and Nana, Babi Gala is formed. Babi Gala is a network of doula narratives and histories that talk about doula existence and the role of doula in a universe. Plus, Babi Gala addresses the social and moral practices of a community. Abya Yala comes from Babi Gala. Abya Yala is a is, is a fourth stage of our worlds that was um, the English word like to say destroyed, but I like to say transitioned. It's is a is a laying of transitions of phases that comes from it. When we take our understandings of Baba Yala and where it comes from, we also have to understand that it means land of um, plenitude, plentiful lands abundancy there's an abundancy of abayala and when we comes into terms of abayala we also have to understand that it is not about this critiquing of how do we identify ourselves and give us our names but if we start imposing names from other tribes and other nations are we not doing the same thing of us start now questioning who we are and where we come from we can still be a collective but it doesn't have to just be abiyala it could be pachamama it could be turtle island it could be oceania it could be many of the names that we call ourselves that's what unity and collectivity comes from so when so as a kuna it, i am not coming from a very popular place, but I will critique other indigenous scholars who use indigenous words without the proper recognitions of where it comes from, because it is very important, because I won't go into your house and be rude and use a word and not recognize you. It's roots. There's a history of roots. There's a profundity of it. And to understand what Abayala is, I don't want you to understand it as a concept of what it is, but as a concept of vitality who is Abayala. Abayala is known as safe territory, land of blood. But as my Dule brother, Danebad Nelson says, Abayala represents the land of full fullness, not of maturity, but of plenitude. It comes from the Dule Gaya language, Dule language, but we also call it as Kuna or Kuna Dule. Abe and Ablis is blood and the word. Yala is land, mountain, continent, territory. There is land of blood, spilled blood and lifeblood. Abeyala is solidarity and collective. With collective solidarity, we are similar to the earth, a land of full plenitude and life, the balance of human and animals, plants and land, water, and many more to understand the death of Abayala is knowing and recognizing that it comes from the four stages of the evolution of our dule worlds, the dule cycle worlds, as our sailas have recounted through Babigala, the four stages of the multiverse dule world, and where intellectual historian Dule Aiban Wagwa has written these descriptions of the four stages. Quote, in the time of that Galib, great cyclones came, which devastated all creation and the known of the land of new creation, which was called Gualacunayala. Many more centuries passed, and in the period of that Garban, a great darkness came, and the darkness ended everything. What there was and the new known land was called Targangunyala. So other many centuries passed, and when Dar Olo Dubiliyaliler, guided the kunas and a great fire broke out. The fire devoured everything that was there, both humans and animals, and the low land of the new co-creation was called Dinguayala. So many centuries passed over Nabguana. Nabguana means Mother Earth and Kuna. At the time of Dad Arban, the tidal wave and the deluge destroyed everything co-created and Nabguana regenerated from the new co-creation called Abiyayala. This is stated from Saila Manitini Vitbi Nabi from Ustup in 1991, a story of Galibi. And this was um, recompiled by our Abiyayala Una historian Iban Wagwa to understand these cycles is a transition um, and to recreate it in such a way in a non dualist space becomes problematizes it right and then we go back to the question well then who are we what does it mean when we use Abayala what why can't we go back to our own linguistic words and use that that is to me it, it is a beautiful thing to use 
when we use the richness of linguistics as Qui and Odilia and Marcelo was talking about, we go back into I start, we start deconstructing and understanding um, plurality, right? Uh, indigeneities, Latinidades, and how and what spaces we come from. Because I grew up being called gringa, and I didn't, and I was like, well, yo no soy gringa, I'm cuna Panamanian. But then it was about how do you tell that story in a space that is unfamiliar to to know what a Kuna Panamanian looks like or what it is or who we are. And breaking that down is all, always this constant reminder of we are constantly renaming ourselves. But that's a journey that's both a professional and a personal journey that we have to contemplate. And when we bring and merge collective and solidarity through music, through linguistics, through activism, through accountabilities, these merge into the aspects of our names are who we are. We give us our names. Now it's our role to question where these other names are coming from. And like Kukuna, with, with the materials of the molas, we get to pick and choose what colors and thread we want and stitch them together. Because at the end of the day, it's the stories that we live in and practice that define us who we are regardless of the spaces we navigate, because every space we go to will always be a space that will question who you are and where our names come from. And it's appointed to, it's important to stay grounded and how we stay grounded is knowing the roots and understanding, okay, we use these words, but let's just stop using Minolo. Let's start following our indigenous scholars that have been publishing for decades, bring them into the classroom, be your own teacher, go to the libraries, pick it up. Nobody, after my grandfather passed away, who was gonna pick up the mola? I had to pick up with it and um, it never left me and I'm still wearing it. Um, thank you, I hope, um, um, thank you for your time. And any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer at the Q&A. Thank you so much, Sue. Um, and thank you all so much for your reflections. I think you all have together raised some really critical questions for us to think about. Um, but before we open the floor for questions and a more intimate conversation with everyone, um, we'd like to give you all um, an opportunity to respond and engage with one another's presentations and conversations. So if you have points you'd like to highlight or questions that came up during your individual presentations, please feel free to share them. Um, uh, hi, Sodilia. Um, well, I um, Sue brought up something very important, right? Like when we talk about labels, we all heard of Yala, we within the movement or within the academia. And they told us it was this, but then now that she described it, you were like, it's not that simple. And it's not that plain, but this is where damage of academia, uh, it hurts the movement, it hurts the communities, or, or and, and, and we have to realize like that the fact that we're sitting here like very, very privileged individuals uh, to have that even time while the farm workers is still out there picking our berries, right? Or where the restaurant workers is still serving the food, the line chef or, um, or the garment workers sewing their clothes. So I think we have to start with our privilege me within uh, human rights movement and you all in academia. But I, I think this is where it shows like whose presentation shows the damage that it does and how it simplifies things. And indigenous people were not that simple. We're complex individuals, our language is complex, our life is complex. The defense of our territory is very complex. And if I were to go to, um, you know, Panama and say, oh yeah, you know, I heard about Abiyala, I might pronounce it wrong and be saying something else because the tone changes, right? I don't know if not, uh, it's a Kuna language that happens. Or if I go to the farm worker, like we're building the movement in Abiyala, well, they're gonna ask me, and what is that? And then I'll be giving the wrong information again. So I just think like for you all, like to really reflect. For me, on this side of, of on the outside of academia, 
I really would want like academia to produce things that will be useful to us. You know, how do we use, how do you bring back that knowledge that has been hidden in academia about our history, about our language, about the importance of language, right? And again, the regular farm worker does not want to transmit the language to their child because of the racism that comes with it, right? I myself did not transmit my language to my child because when I came here at the age of 10, I didn't speak Spanish or English. And I wanted her to learn just English so that she doesn't go through that. But with that was a loss of a language. So I think how do we reflect, how do we motivate people and create information that is easy to understand that is shared around so that we continue to exit even on this side of the border, you know? I'm sorry guys, but I could only talk so much today and then my nose starts running and I'm just like, so somebody else take the microphone, please. Laskamati, thank you. Um, I think that it's important. I think like what Sue said, you know, we are reconnecting, but reconnecting to what, right? It's, it's finding back to like who we are, right? And that's in the in the in the stories of our families, right? Oral stories is is part of that. Um, and you know, I think that word has been used a lot, reconnecting, reconnecting, reconnecting. Um, I'm actually just tired of hearing that word. Um, you know, it's it's our part of our identities is also in our food ways. So que comemos, like, what do we still eat? You know, I still eat tamales, I used to eat po pozole, right? Um, so it's important to, to think about that as well, right? Um, and uh, Marcelo mentioned about um, using, uh, you know, indigenous um, instruments as, you know, and calling them armas. You know, I think that's, that's very, that was very powerful to hear uh, it reminded me when I was playing the wewet, the big drum. Um, it's something powerful, you know, like to hear the drums. It's it's so healing. Um, I last week I went to the local college powwow. powwow. Just hearing the the drum is 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 amazing. Yeah. See if I could just add um, that. I find myself, especially in this, you know, I feel a, very conflicted with the position of academia, just to be transparent about that, Odilia, and I find myself in that position that it actually, like, oftentimes I always have to resist the gravity of being taken away from the act of practices. And so just that's why I feel like eventually where I'm at in my path, I feel so committed to the practice and also for me, practice means the, to play the drum, right? Let's let's talk about the drum, but let's play it. We have to feel it, and there's no replacement. You know, there's no way to theorize uh, that that would replace that. Um, there's let's uh, feel the smoke, right, from the from copal or whatever medicine that our ancestors burned and that our relatives burn, right? That communities burn. Um, plant oils, right? Let's let's um, it, I feel like it's about the way that reconnecting, I think for sure we should problematize, but the reason it resonates with me is because it's about like memory. And um, a lot of times I can speak for myself and a lot of the students that I work with, like we, because of this naming and we don't remember who we are, you know? And I think that that's how I've come to understand ceremony, there's like a really uh, powerful quote from Gregory Cajete, who's an amazing native scientist and thinker and artist. Uh, he's, a, I believe he's Pueblo, um, but he says like that ceremony is where we remember to remember. 
right? And I think that that's why I feel very committed to this thing that we call ceremony or, you know, our spiritual practices, because it's like, um, there's a way, there's, there's uh, something that is, needs to still be um, activated is all I'm saying. Like the instruments activate something that's already there. So yeah, it's problematic to call it reconnecting that it's already there. But it's like a seed that hasn't been watered in a long time for a lot of us. Again, for some folks, I need to also, I, I also always situate myself in terms of privilege. Odilia, so thank you for that invitation of like, even though I'm very critical of mestizaje or some of us are very critical of Latin, Latinidad, I still have benefited from the privilege of being able to pass as Latinx or to be passed as, as a, as um, only right or to pass as 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 mestizo right or and I think that so I, I'm speaking from that position when I say that for me it's very important to what are those technologies that I'm keeping close and that I'm continuing to practice so that I remember you know and I and again it's because of the dominant day-to-day -day life you know I've had one of my Mapuche relatives said that to me um, in one of my visits there she said you know what's what's the biggest obstacle to you, you know, remembering that you're Mapuche and she just kind of like gestured to the world. She's like, just walk, walk down the street, just the world as it is. So like, how do we, that, that's just what I'm trying to like, um, just be militant about my, con my commitment to that, to, to like, what are those practices? And I, you know, the language, the, the culture and the struggle too, Adilia, thank you. Like the, like organizing for me is practice. Like, that's what I mean. Like we need to organize uh, and, and organize here, you know, supporting my Payam Kawichim relatives, right? That's, that's practice, part of my practice, how to be a good relative to people. I'm a guest in these lands. I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording, um, but we'll continue the conversation.